Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we celebrate life and as we also celebrate with our Lakeside Lutheran High School and their choir. The wonderful blessings that God provides to us will be seen throughout our service. Uh, Please follow along in the bulletin or on the screen as we are following service of word and sacrament and yet it's going to have some changes in it because of our guests that are with us. We'll begin our service this morning.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our scripture lessons this morning are being used for our Sanctity of Life Sunday, our Celebration of Life Sunday. Our first lesson comes to us from Isaiah chapter 46. The two verse, first two verses of this text will be the text of the sermon. God says to his prophet Isaiah, Listen to me, you house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. Remember this. Fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. This is the word of God. Our second lesson this morning comes to us from Acts chapter 17. Listen now to these words. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. This is the word of God. Our verse of the day. Alleluia. He said to me, You are my servant in whom I will display my splendor. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson comes to us from John chapter 14. Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. 
On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them is the one who loves me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. scripture lesson of the prodigal son. The son selfishly requested his inheritance, now basically telling the father he wished he were dead. When his father graciously gave him his inheritance, the son squandered it on water, wild living. But when the son saw his error in his ways and repented of his actions, his father welcomed him back, restoring him a member of the family. What a beloved father is ours.
God's amazing grace. In spite of our struggles to remain faithful to him, our God remains faithful to us. Just as the Father welcomed the penitent son back, forgiving him completely, so our Heavenly Father welcomes us back when we stray from him. Each day, may this be our prayer. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. As we make our journey through this life, may we always walk by faith with our eyes firmly fixed on the heavenly joy that awaits us and all believers in him. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As the pastor had indicated, we're going to be looking at just a couple of verses out of the Old Testament reading of Isaiah. It said, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you who remain in the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you, I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. This is God's word. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a busy Sunday. You've got the Lakeside Choir here. Um, one of your graduates uh, runs my home for mothers. So um, we have a, a special part, place in our heart for Lakeside. Uh, Brianne, you probably knew her as Brianne Klug, but... Uh, uh, she's Brianne Hansen now, and she's a happy mother. She comes back off maternity leave on Wednesday, so I'll get to see her again. The, um, one of the worst words that I read in the Bible are the words you do not realize. And these are words that are found 
uh, in the uh, message to the church at Laodicea. Uh, it goes like this. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You do not realize. These were people who sat in church. These were people who went through the motions. These are people who felt everything was going well. Remember that the letter was written to the church at Laodicea. It wasn't just written to the citizens of Laodicea. And the reason the words frighten me is I sometimes worry that I might see this in myself. That life goes on kind of the way I think it should, pretty safe, pretty, you know, pretty routine. We have our things that we do in church. Uh, we, we good Lutherans, we know when to stand, when to sit, you know, what to sing. Um, you know, a lot of us could, could go through the whole service without the hymnal. Uh, we get very routine, and we do not realize. Well, you have to understand that this is a problem that affects believers throughout all of history. And I believe this is what was going on during the time of Isaiah. The northern kingdom of Israel had fallen. Uh, it required a certain amount of uh, lack of cohesiveness between the northern and the southern kingdom, that the northern kingdom had fallen. And now Isaiah is saying you're in trouble in the southern kingdom. The same thing that happened to the northern kingdom is going to happen to you. And there always is a remnant of people who are faithful, people who are loyal, people who are overwhelmed by everything going on around them. They really truly are people of faith, doing the right things, saying the right things, believing the right things, and all of this is falling down around them. And Isaiah offers these incredible words of comfort. I am with you. Okay, so what prompts me to be here is a reminder to Christians, well-meaning Christians, that despite the way things are looking, God cares. On January 22, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court made it legal for a woman to take the life of her unborn children. It was interesting, if you read the documents from back then, uh, a lot of the talk was kind of on the order of... Um, it was kind of, the, the talks were kind of on the order of, uh, we really don't know when life begins. If, we, if it began at conception, then it would be protected and so forth. All of that, of course, doesn't matter today. If you know anything about modern abortion rhetoric, uh, it's no longer, is it wrong to take the life? They call it a sad but necessary evil in order to protect a paramount woman's right to make decisions, so right to choose. So what I want to illustrate for you this morning is the value of human life. And I'm going to make three points. First of all, that the um, value is defined by its creator. Secondly, it's evidenced by its redemption. And thirdly, this makes you and me stewards over life. So let's do the first one. Value uh, is defined by its creator. It's a, it's a standard Christian mantra, especially among Christian Bible-believing Christians, that God is the creator. He created human life. This is the tension between creation and evolution, but we believe that Scripture is true when it says God created human life. And you see all sorts of reinforcement of it throughout Scripture. In uh, Psalm 139, uh, you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Deuteronomy 32, there is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. And you and I accept this as, a, as an academic issue. We accept this to be true. And in our text, he says to the people, I have made you. Now, before we go any further, you've got to stop for a moment and take that into consideration that when we're talking about human life, there is an author who has made human life. Now, I spend way too much of my life for the past 30 years in airports, flying, and renting cars. And one thing I know is that when I go to buy a car, if I have anything to say about it, I really, really do not want a rental car, a car that somebody's rented. Why? Because experience has shown me that people treat rental cars not like they would treat their own car. For example, if your friend asked to borrow your car, would you want him to treat it this way? But when you are in the car rental business, you see that people treat cars this way all the time. There are things you find in the car, in the seats and so forth, that tell you they don't take care of it. Give me, let me give you another illustration. 
I was going to be an architect if I wasn't going to be a preacher. So in 1999, when Diane and I decided we were going to build our, our, our home, our perfect home, we designed it as a perfect home. Landscaping is a hobby, so forth. This is our home. I always wanted a home with a front porch. I always wanted a home with a picket fence. And I always wanted a home with lots of flowers. So we built it. This, is, this home for us is perfect. We sit in two acres of woods. It's just gorgeous. My mom and dad live next door. It's perfect. It's perfect. Until last year, last year, I needed to talk to the bank because I needed to borrow some money against the house so I can have the house painted. Now, to me, I am the one who owns this house. I built this house. And to me, this house is priceless. By the time the appraiser gets done at the bank, this is how he sees the house. You know, because you have to you know, beg and, and scratch and everything for any value. The point is, is that the author values life even above what life itself values life. When you are sitting there evaluating, asking yourself, am I worth anything? You may be at a low point in your life. You may think your life has no value whatsoever. But the reality is that God loves your life. He created your life. And no matter how, what quality of life you have, whether you are intellectually challenged, whether you are physically challenged, whether you are attractive, whether you are ugly, whether you are you know, very gifted, whether you have no real evident talents at all, the value of your life is rooted, first of all, in the creator of your life. And that leads us to our second point. It's, this is evidenced by its redemption. Now, we would think, saying that God created life, that that should be enough. God created life, that settles the matter. It has absolute value. But he didn't just start, uh, stop there. He kept going. When we look at the problem of sin in the world, it's interesting, when I, I teach a course... Um, I teach a course in bioethics and biotechnology at Concordia University, and I got a class starting on the 25th. And the, um, so we get this hodgepodge of, of, of people interested in these issues, and I've lectured down at the pharmacy building, and once in a while during Q&A, people will ask, well, why? why? Why couldn't God have just decreed that all sin should be forgiven? Why must God demand such a high price the sacrifices, why must it be so bloody and so messy? Well, part of the problem is, is that, um, first of all, it began with Adam and Eve. God said, you've got it perfect. I give it to you perfect. And they decided otherwise. They decided that they wanted to live life their way. Now, what's interesting is that we're told that sin so multiplied in the world that by the time we got to Noah, God had made this determination that because of the inclination of man's heart is evil, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to preserve Noah and his family and these animals. Now, if you read the account of the ark carefully, not only was this the status of man before the flood, but when the flood waters had subsided, and Noah and his family got out of the ark, and they built the altar, and they made the sacrifice, and God put the, uh, the uh, rainbow in the sky. He made this proclamation to him. He said, he said, I am never going to flood the whole world again. I'm never going to bring this destruction. And this is the part. Even though every inclination of man's heart is evil. The flood didn't clean it up. The flood was just a restart. And Paul in the New Testament said that the sinful mind is hostile to God. And you know this. If you sit still long enough to think about your life, you find yourself constantly in a battle with God. Some of you may not have wanted to come here this morning. Some of you may not have wanted to go out in the cold. Some of you may not want to study God's Word. Some of you may not want to help people who need help. These are always that inner battle that's going on. The Apostle Paul said, the good that I would do, that I do not. The evil I would not do, this I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. This is the kind of stuff that goes on in your life all the time. When you, the Lakeside students, you're in high school. When I was in high school, I was at Badger High School in Lake Geneva. I was trying to convince my parents to let me quit the church because I was sick of church. The sinful body is constantly fighting against God. 
There's a constant battle against God. And don't think it gets better when you become a preacher. Because sometimes we preachers still have that battle going on all the time. But you have it here. You have it here as a congregation. Now this morning, we all uh, stood and we made confession of our sins. Do you remember? Now, have you ever done it before? I would guess if this congregation is like every other congregation I preached at in our church body, uh, every week we make a confession of sins. At the church that I serve, uh, I rewrote the confession of sins. Every Sunday it's different because I found that people were saying it, not looking, not thinking, and so forth, so I change it all the time. And the sad reality is this. God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for the sin. I'm not going to you know, do it anymore. And then next week, we hit the replay button. Next week, we do it again. And the week after, we do it again. And we keep coming back. And this is oftentimes the, you know, perceived as the way we show gratitude to God. But remember this. God demonstrates his love for you in this. While we were still sinners, he died for you. There are those holy moments in your life. There are those times in your life when you are walking the straight line, you are singing the praises to the top of your heart, you are truly spiritual, you are engaged in study and so forth. He didn't die for you then, while you were still sinners. When you were doing the things you were not supposed to be doing, saying the things you were not supposed to be saying, and thinking the things you were not supposed to be thinking, he died for you. He died for you. So you might be inclined to say, well, whatever. Whatever. We hear it every Sunday, right? Have you ever noticed sermons pretty much follow the same pattern? We're all guilty of sin, but Jesus died for our sins. Hallelujah. It just kind of goes through the same cycle. It's always the same thing. Always the same thing. I want you to realize that you long for this redemption with such passion. You long for this redemption with such longing that you aren't even aware of it most of the time. Now, we just got through the Christmas season. We watched A Christmas Carol. Why is it that we look forward to the time when Ebenezer Scrooge is converted, is changed from being a miser to being generous? Why is it that we look for the Grinch's heart to grow, to be larger than it was before? Why do we look for that to happen? Why do we... Uh, watch the movie where Gru becomes nice instead of being the evil criminal he is. If you went to see the movie, I can only imagine why is it you were brought almost to tears when he is reunited with his father. Why is that? Why does that appeal to you? Why does the idea of living happily ever after become basically the, the code message for most fictional writing? Why is it that the evil villains in Disney movies, we want to see destroyed? We want to see them beaten. We want to either, if they're not going to be converted, they've got to be beaten. Why is it we long for these simplistic, idealistic versions of the good old days? It's because deep down inside, your baptismal faith wants you to see the head of Satan crushed. Your baptismal faith desires a reunion that you know just isn't really possible in this world. C.S. Lewis made the comment once, he said, if you find yourself longing for something that you can never really have in this world, chances are it's because you were created for something not of this world. And because of the seed of faith, you believe that. That when you read the story of Jesus leaving the 99 to go to find the one, you look at the one and you say, that's me. He's looking for me. It means that all the bad things I've done in life, there is forgiveness. He's looking for me. I tell you that when the choir, when you sang that song, Coming Home, um, the prodigal son, why is that song so great? Why is it so meaningful? Why does it have impact? Why does it, it move you emotionally? It's because you know that someplace in all of this mess that we have in life, that there is redemption, that there is restoration. And the message of Scripture is that there is restoration in the person of Jesus Christ, that there is a time when we come home, 
that there is a reunion, that there is a time when evil is squelched. But it comes at the highest of all prices. You can't do it. You can't cause it to happen. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesians, you're saved by grace, not by works. Can't boast about it. It wasn't like you made the good decision to come to church or you made the good decision to uh, come to faith. These are all things that God moves you to do by virtue of your faith. This incredible and miraculous power that enables you to believe things that are hoped for and certain of things that you do not see. I want you to imagine this for a moment. When you are concerned about where you are spiritually, you know, because I didn't always want to be involved in pro-life issues. I didn't want to always be concerned about unborn children and the elderly and the disabled and so forth. But there comes a time in your life when you spiritually continue to grow and you find yourself on Good Friday standing on the hill. And when you're standing on the hill, I want you to ignore the guards who are gambling for the garments of Jesus. I want you to ignore the, the disciples who are standing off in, dis, in the distance out of fear of what's been happening. I want you to ignore John and Mary at the foot of the cross. I want you to ignore the other people making fun of him and spitting on him. And I want you to look real closely and see yourself there, alone, looking up, and you realize my sins drove the nails. His perfect love drove him to do it for me. This is what we mean when we talk about the value of human life. That this isn't just something that God created, but God said, I am so committed to it, I will take on the task of redeeming it. This is why life is valuable, and this is what drives you to then be concerned about others. Because it's not easy to be concerned about others. So we're going to talk about being a steward of life. The balance of our text is this. I have upheld you since you were conceived. I have carried you since your birth. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. Does this sound like a God who doesn't care? And you might be sitting here saying, well, I've made some wrong decisions, even wrong decisions regarding life. Maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe you've counseled somebody and thought maybe it's the best thing at this time of life. Maybe you've made wrong decisions on caring for somebody as they get older and so forth. Do you think God is deserting you? Do you think God doesn't care? He sacrificed his son. And this is the result. You are no longer a slave but a son. Since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And this makes you and me a steward. You know, the mantra today in the abortion rights movement is my body, my choice. But the reality is, it's God's body. He gave it to you, and you are to treat it accordingly. So we're assigned this task, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. This is about the most thankless work you can do. I have been doing this for over 30 years. Never once has an unborn child come back to thank me. I have helped care for people who are dying to make their life, their last moments more comfortable and so forth. Because they die, they never come back to thank you. You love because he loved you first. A new command I give you, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You are known not by your membership at St. Paul's and Fort Atkinson. You're known not by your attendance at Lakeside Lutheran High School. It's by the way you demonstrate a love for which there is no reward, a love in which you do not get any return. The, um, when Jesus said this, he said, I was hungry and you gave me something to drink. I was thirsty, you gave me something I was hungry, gave me something to eat. Thirsty, gave me something to drink. 
I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me and they said, how can this be? He said, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine and sisters of mine, you did for me. You act because you've not lost sight of the fact of what it was like to stand at the foot of the cross. What makes people pro-life is because they realize what they were before God if it were not for Jesus. We do love because he first loved us. And I want to encourage all of you to start looking at the way you live in this regard as an expression of your conviction about what was done for you. You know, being pro-life doesn't mean being a member of Christian Life Resources. Being pro-life doesn't mean just, you know, saying a few times that you don't believe in abortion or something. It means actively doing something. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We've got an affiliate uh, in Watertown, the Alpha Center. Uh, I'm actually having, uh, I think, breakfast on Tuesday with Dan Newman, who's the new director up there. We're going to be talking about expanding the ministry. That's one way you can do it. Other ways you can do it is instead of being a critic, be a positive influence. Uh, just closing, I just want to leave this one last thought with you. And that is this, that uh, Peter wrote this. He, he wrote this, he said, um, uh, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. And if you are like most people I know, nobody is ever asking you the reason for the hope that you have. And the, re the reason for that is that we don't look any more hopeful than anybody else. So how do you look more help hopeful? It is when you are loving and expecting nothing in return. It's when you are holding the hands of the dying, knowing that they can't reward you. It's when you're going to visit Grandma, even though she no longer has her mind about her, she can't kiss you on the cheek and she can't squeeze your hand. It's when you are speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And people sooner or later are going to wonder, why do you do it? And God will open you a door, and you're going to be able to tell them what it means to have been lost and to have been found and to be the object of God's amazing grace. Let's rise and make confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. For every unborn child and for his or her mother and father, that God might teach us how to love and support them. For women and men whose hearts are weighed down by the sin of abortion, that you, O merciful Lord, might bring them peace. For all medical researchers, that God might give them the grace to use their talents and skills 
to preserve and protect all human life from conception to natural death. Hear our prayer, o Lord. For our legislators, that they may preserve the right of each of us to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hear our prayer, Lord. For a growing love for the weak and the vulnerable, that in the model of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we might work to sustain and protect the lives of all who are in need. Hear our prayer, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word expressed through our choir, through the Lakeside Choir, and also through the message that we hear about the life you have given to us. We ask that you would work that message into us, that it might not be just something that we know, but something that we confess and uphold. We ask for your blessing on all those who are not feeling well, those who are sick, those who are in the hospital. We ask that you would provide the means for them to be well, and if it is your will, to allow them to return home to worship with us. Lord, we also ask that you hear us as we bring you our private petitions. We also ask that you hear us as we pray boldly and confidently as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Congregation may be seated for our closing hymn. 